vain pursuit number four. I'm hoping that there's an end to all of these vain pursuits that uh, Solomon talks about in Ecclesiastes. Unfortunately, the whole book is full of them. This topic that we're going to talk about today, which is work, A lot of us, because we like the pleasure of our world, take every opportunity to get out of work. (laughs) And and maybe for some of us here today, uh, we, we actually maybe even gravitate towards laziness more than we gravitate towards being a workaholic. But as we look at the Scriptures today in Ecclesiastes, what we're going to see is that all work, even though it might have some benefit to us under the sun, is really vanity. Vanity meaning it's empty, it's it's worthless, it's just a vapor and it's a mist. But at the same time, we need to realize in a biblical theology is that work is God's assigned task to the believer, to humanity. God Himself worked for six days and then He rested on the seventh. God created. Jesus Christ worked on the cross our salvation. So work, from God's perspective, is very much a good thing. But when we take heaven, when we take God out of the picture, everything that work represents is just plain old vanity. And I think for all of us here this morning, as we talk about this, and remember, we're talking about this in the context of pursuing God, seeking God's kingdom and His righteousness, And not all of these other things that are in our world. The benefits that come from work are tremendous. When you actually work and you get accolades, when you work and you have money to spend, all of those things push us in this direction to think more highly of work than maybe we should. The challenge for us this morning is to actually have a balance between running after work in a vain way or actually having this balance where we're actually called to work by God. And for some of us, we actually dread some of our jobs. We have a problem in the workplace. We don't maybe like where we work or we move around often because we just can't seem to fit into that workplace. Well, all of these things God actually has an answer for in His Word. So let's not be workaholics. Let's say that right up the front. But let's not be lazy either. So as we look at Psalm Sorry, as we look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2, turn with me there, and we're going to look at what Solomon actually says about work, his laboring, his toil. And in verse 18, and this is such, he starts off with such strong language here. In verse 18, he says, I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me, and who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will be master of all for which I have toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What has man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. 
There is nothing better for a person than he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom, knowledge, and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to the one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. This writing that Solomon writes is really a memoir of his life. He's reflecting back on all of his work during this passage that he's done over the course of his life. And he comes to this conclusion. And remember, everything he's talking about is everything under the sun. When we take God out of the picture, all of this stuff is vanity. Well, why is work vain? Well, the first thing that he begins talking about is that our benefit of our labor is enjoyed by others. And I want us to really think about this this morning. He says that, he says that right off the bat, he says, I hated all my toil. He hated his toil so much because he must leave it to the man who will come after him. Our labor is left to someone else. You might have a job. You might accomplish things. But you don't get to enjoy that forever. It just gets left for somebody else to have the advantage of. This actually, in Solomon's mind, is a great injustice. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's a, it's a problem. It's so empty and vain. But yet, we get so focused on maybe the next career advancement, the next thing that we get to do in the workplace. And we toil for for some of us that run our own businesses. We just pour our whole lives into that. And in fact, there's a ton of people that are Christians that spend more time in their business than they do in the church. And they've drifted away from the church. Because they're laboring, they're toiling in this place thinking it's got some eternal reward. We actually need a balance in our lives if we're going to work as God has created us to work, but not work in a way where everything we put our energy and time into is just vanity. Solomon actually hated this. We actually should too. Not hate it to the point where, you know what, I'm not going to do my work I'm just going to check out because that's not what God is wanting of us. He's not asking us to check out. The fact that our, enjoy, our labor will be enjoyed by someone else caused Solomon, to, as it says, to live in despair. And he said that it was vanity and a great evil. So not only does he hate it, and he's got this anger towards all of this labor that he's doing, but he gets really no eternal value from. But he also, it also made him despair, which means he lost hope. Let's stop for a minute and think about that. Maybe, just maybe, one of the reasons in our world that people are living without hope is because they're so focused on the vanity of what they do. Because just like Solomon, if you've taken God out of the picture and you realize that every single thing that you do today, tomorrow, the next day is going to be enjoyed by someone else. Oh, why do I do this? And it brings you to this place of hopelessness, feeling despaired. And not only is it vanity, but it's just this great evil. It's just wrong. It's an evil. Now, Solomon is saying this in the context of removing God from the picture. 
all of the laboring that is done under the sun brings him to this place that's not good. Full of hopelessness, full of anger and hatred. But this is actually our world. I went on the internet this week and I got some catchphrases that you're probably familiar with about work. Here's, here's one. It just says, no amount of money is worth your real golden years of youth. Take the position offering less pay and more happy life experiences. Why do you think they have to advertise like that? Because we all know that it's vanity. Learn to live better, our world tells us. Stop waiting to live your life. Start now. And make every moment count. Don't wait for happiness. Experience it now. You see, the reason why our world has these sayings or these catchphrases is because every single person, when they actually stop and they think about the work that they do, we all know intrinsically that it is just vanity. We know and we've seen where people have done great things only to be enjoyed by others. And the world says just work harder. Work harder, work harder. And the danger, the danger for us as Christians is that we get sucked into the world's philosophy about work. And this is actually, there's a fine line between stepping into this place where I'm so consumed with my work that I'm vainly going down this direction when God's like, you know what? I've actually created work for your benefit if you put me first in your life. And that's, that's hard for us to make this transition because we're so focused on the things that we do and, and being recognized for the things that we do. And for a lot of Christians... This is just my opinion over all Christians as I've met them. Is that I think as Christians, we actually gravitate, we kind of get that work is vanity. We, we talk so much about the fact that, you know what, work is something that we just have to do here and we're going off to this eternal place. It's going to be full of wonderful things. And we, we, we say, okay, so I don't want to pursue that. But at the same time, we become so lazy that we've lost a work ethic. So historically, when you look back at the church, what you see is you see this Protestant, it's called the Protestant work ethic that was brought on by the Plymouth Puritans. And they had this work ethic that was maybe to the extreme. But they understood that God, when we bring God into the picture, that work is actually created for our benefit. Our benefit. And it's about learning that balance. You see, vainly pursuing work is not just being an alcoholic, or sorry, a workaholic. If you're a workaholic, you are so focused on work, you are vainly pursuing work. But vainly pursuing work happens as you remove God out of the equation of work. And you might have done that this morning. You might have moved, just said, you know what, I'm just working, and you, and, and you haven't brought God into your work. And if you're working and you're not bringing God into your work, you're really just vainly pursuing work. Because whenever we take God out of the picture, it just leaves us. You see, God created humanity to work. 
And God Himself has given us an example of work. Jesus. God in His creation. And in fact, what we see in Scripture is that God enjoys work. And God's work is not vain for Him. And neither is our work when God is in the picture. So let's bring, and and maybe this is just a new thought for you this morning. (laughs) Let's bring God into our work. And and maybe you need to actually stop and pray and ask God, well, God, how how do I bring you into my labor, into my toil? How do I do this? If I want to pursue you and seek your kingdom, then, and I don't want to go vainly pursuing this labor and this toil. I don't want to go down that road. But how do I, how do I bring God into my work? Well, First of all, we have to get off of the train that says that I'm pursuing work or or labor or toiling and start pursuing God. Here's the second thing that he starts to talk about. And this is where we really see how we can bring God into our work. So you'll notice as Solomon is going on here and he's talking about his hatred, his despair over work and the reality of work. And if this doesn't speak to the reality of everyday life, I don't know, I don't know what does. But I want you to notice in verses 22 and 23, he drives this home. He says, what has a man from all the toil and striving of heart which he toils beneath the sun? And then he says this, this this is us, this is our life, this is your life. For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. How many of you, how many of us, go to work, and it's kind of like, i got to do this again. We're sad about it. We have sorrow. For some of us, we are in places where it's incredibly repetitive and we're just doing the same thing over and over and over again. Sometimes it's hard. And you're like, oh my goodness, I wish I could just stop doing this. I'm so tired of this. And sometimes we do. We find another job thinking that, oh, you know what? If I move from this place over to here, I won't have the same sorrow. Well, guess what? A couple years goes by and you have the sorrow. And then he talks about this vexation. That's Vexation is another word for frustration. Being annoyed. How many times have you been annoyed at work? <laughs> Come on. Daily. Those of you that are in customer service, come on, let's get real. You are at your wit's end with that Karen <laughs> that comes in. Come on, right? You know what I'm talking about. You're annoyed. You're frustrated. You go home. And on your way home, you're trying to get all this stuff out of your system before you get home to your family. And then, for those of us that carry responsibility, and maybe even for some of us that don't carry responsibility, We wake up in the middle of the night and we're thinking about a problem at work. It's exactly what Solomon is saying here. And we get stressed because we're vainly pursuing this work. And what we need to realize is that when we've removed God out of the picture, labor creates personal stress in your life. It just does. Whether it's just the sorrow, sadness of doing the same thing in and out, day after day, dealing with the customers, dealing with the people, getting all this stuff done, and at the end of the day you go to sleep trying because you're so tired, and then you wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning thinking about a problem. Because your brain is there. We're all here, right? We, We all do this. 
What God is calling us to is actually bringing Him into our work. So how do we actually do this when this is the reality? Well, ask God to help you with the Karen. Ask God to give you the joy that He promises in labor. We'll get there in a minute. Ask God for the wisdom to deal with the problems of work. God doesn't promise the fact that there's not going to be problems in the workplace. But He actually, we're going to see it in a minute, we're going to read it in a minute, He actually promises believers who bring God into the workplace, He actually promises you wisdom and knowledge to deal with all that stress. All of those problems. Now does that sound like a joy? Yes, it does. But so often what usually happens is that we are so focused in our vainly pursuing of work, we actually take God right away. God is just for Sunday. God is just for our eternal salvation. God has nothing to do with the things that I do from 9 to 5, Monday to Friday. But what Solomon is telling us here is that if you've taken God, if you've just taken God totally out of your work, you're vainly pursuing work. You're not really pursuing God the way that God has called us to pursue Him. And it's going to be full of sorrow. It's going to be full of stress. It's going to be just this annoying frustration for your life. So let's, let's bring God into our work. Let's, let's learn this balance so that we're not vainly pursuing the things of this world, but that we're pursuing Christ and God and what God has for us. Because I just want to remind you, God created you to work. He made the garden. And He placed Adam and Eve in the garden to tend it, to keep it, long before sin entered the world. God wants you to work. To be fruitful, to be multiplying, to have dominion over. And that all happens through work. Hear this. You don't need to be a workaholic to vainly pursuing work. Now notice, here, here's, here's the turning point in this passage. Because this is where, this is where the hope of the Christian is when it comes to work, as, as Solomon starts talking about this. Because Solomon, he's so upset, he so much hates this labor and this toil. We've talked about his accomplishments and all of the things that he's done, and, he, and he's so sorrowful, he's so hatred of this thing, he gets to this point where he's like, you know what, I can't keep God out of the picture anymore. I have to bring God back into this picture to help me get through this. Notice verses 24 on through to 26. He says, There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat, drink, and find enjoyment in his toil. This is like the opposite of what he was just saying. He's like, this is so vain. This is so wrong. It needs to be flipped on the other side. It needs to be turned around. That there's nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. And then he says this, this also I saw is from the hand of God. He's like, you know what? There's no way this can happen without God's hand being in the work. And he goes on to say this, and we need to hear this. He said, this also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from Him, who can eat and who can have enjoyment? You see, the challenge for us today is to bring God right into our work and involve Him in all of this stuff if we want to have enjoyment in our work. He says this, highlight this, underline this, this is so important. He says, for to the one who pleases Him, God has given wisdom, knowledge, and joy. But to the sinner, 
He has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to the one who pleases God. What does this mean? Well, first of all, God is blessing the one that pleases Him. To please God is really a matter of faith. You can't do anything. You can't act in a certain way. You can't be righteous in your own eyes to the point where God is happy with you. In fact, the only way to please God, as it says in the Scriptures, is to actually have faith. Faith is believing, hoping, and acting on all the promises of God. Faith is about putting your personal trust into Jesus. Putting all of your eggs in that basket, so to speak. And saying, I'm going to have faith in Jesus in God. That is what pleases our Heavenly Father. And so what we see here is when we get in this place where we're actually pleasing God, which is walking by faith. Let's hear that. That's walking by faith. Walking by faith in our salvation, but also walking by faith in our workplace. Trusting God that God's going to meet us in our workplace. Bringing decisions to Him. Praying about things that we need to do at work. Asking God to be there in the day, in the moment, for the strength to deal with the Karens in our world. It's bringing Him in. So, do you want some wisdom for work? To make work joyful? Please Him. Walk by faith. If you want some knowledge, knowledge is the ability to know how to do problems. Well, ask Him. Because the promise is joy in the labor. You see, so many people want to live their life without God that there's no joy to work. But when you actually bring God into the picture, what happens is that you suddenly realize that I've been given this gift, this gift of work to keep me being obedient to God. Now, it really contrasts here because it basically says, you know what? If you're not living by faith, if you're not walking with God and bringing God into this, then the, then there's this other thing that Solomon points out. Is that, and I'll read it again because we need to wrap our heads around this. He says, but to the sinner. So the sinner is the one that is not in right standing with God. The sinner is the one who doesn't bring God into their life. The sinner is the one who we all wear until we put faith in Jesus Christ. And we're made righteous by Christ's death and resurrection. He says, but to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to the one who pleases God. Now, one of the hardest things we have as Christians is that we struggle with people who maybe have money that are outside the church. And we look at them and we kind of go, you know what, I wish I had uh, what they had. Or we look at the the 1% of our world uh, that have all of the money of the world or the 99% of the money in the world. And we look at them and we're just kind of like, you know, they're making some so many bad decisions from taking God out of the picture. We get upset about it. Ecclesiastes and Proverbs speak so much to finances. God actually says that all money, all wealth is time and chance. And it's God who holds the purse strings for everything in this world. Now some days it's really hard to to believe that. When we're looking at the stock market or we're looking at the real estate market or we're looking at inflation and all this kind of stuff and we kind of go, oh my goodness, there's so many variables, so many things going on. But if God is God 
And he's sovereign. He holds all that stuff in his hand. And he is sovereign. And he is in control of all those things. And so what we realize here, and Solomon has realized it too, he's like, you know, if you're not pleasing God and you're just a sinner, this is even more vain for you because you can't find wisdom and knowledge and joy. You get laboring under this stress. All of the work that you do is going to be enjoyed by someone else who's going to come after you. And guess what? I, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, actually gets to decide who gets what. And Solomon is like, you know what? This is so vain. It is incredibly vain for the sinner. We want to actually have a gain from laboring. And the only way to do that is to bring God into the picture. The gain is not wealth. It's enjoyment. Because God created you to work to enjoy the things that God has ordained for humanity to enjoy. But if you're going to keep God out of, <laughs> out of your work, then you're basically saying, you know what, God, you can be over here on the shelf. I'll pursue you when it's convenient to me. But I'm going to pursue work. And I guarantee you, I, I guarantee you that if that's where your headspace is and that's how you're working nine to five, you are going to be so frustrated by work. And when you stop and you think about everything that work is, you're going to be sorrowful and hopeless and sad, just like Solomon was. I want to encourage you this morning to stop vainly pursuing work and bring God into your work. We all work. We all do things day after day. God wants your faith to be everything. He wants your faith to be in salvation, that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again and gave you eternal life, gave you some, he gave you an abundant life, something to look forward to. But when he says that I've given you life and abundant life, it doesn't mean that it starts later, it starts now. But in order for it to start now, we have to bring God, we need to involve God in every area of our life. And we've been talking about the wisdom of this world. We've talked about accomplishments. We're talking about work today. Where we've talked about pleasure. We've got to bring God into all of these areas if we're really going to pursue Him. We don't need to perform anything for God. We just need to receive God's gift to us whether it's salvation or this gift of enjoyment, enjoying one's labor, because we've put God into our work. So ask Him. Ask Him to help you with, this, with the stress. Ask Him to, to help bring the knowledge and wisdom that you need to your workplace. And watch you change from sorrow, vexation, hopelessness to joy because that's actually what the word of god promises us and what solomon is writing about as he's brought god into this context does this sound like a good idea it sounds like a great idea and all of us need to practice this if we're going to be pursuing god amen amen let me pray Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for Your Word that enlightens us. Lord, I pray today as we've talked about this subject and the vanity of laboring and toil and work, that You would help each of us in our own ways, in our own contexts, bring God into our laboring. 
Lord, I thank You for giving us this gift to work. Lord, I pray that we would not be workaholics. That we would not be lazy. That we would not exclude You from our work. But that we would bring You, invite You in, and welcome You in to everything that we do. So God, I thank You for Your presence, Your wisdom, Your Holy Spirit that guides us, that leads us each and every day as we work and as we live our lives fully for You. And may our hope be in Jesus, not in what we do. And we pray all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.